just keep showing up and if you're doing the work that resonates with yourself and makes yourself proud that's enough Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is one for the creatives. We talk about building a career as an artist, creating art with meaning and a message, and tips for the artist's journey. So our guest today is Natalie Byrne. Natalie is a Latina illustrator and author based in London, whose main purpose is to educate on mental health, relationships, and social issues through her colorful art style. She has a book called Periods, which educates people of all ages and gender about everything they need to know about female menstruation and has also worked with brands such as Adobe, Logitech, Vans, and Nike. When Natalie is not illustrating, she runs the Going Places podcast where she invites friends and guests to talk about their creativity, process, and journey. Hi, Natalie. Welcome to the podcast. How are you feeling today? I'm good, thanks. Thanks so much for having me on. I feel so honored to be here. I'm <laughs> such a big fan of yours and you've inspired me so much. So. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to get into today. So before we go deep into the interview, tell us about your background and how you became an illustrator. Well, I think from very small, I always drew a lot. And I think somewhere along the way, well, I'm not going to be vague. I know exactly what happened. <laughs> I know that for many, many creative people and many people they get some sort of feedback when they're younger or, you know, time to grow up. I had an art teacher who told me that I'll never get anywhere if I wanted to do political work. And so when I was about a teenager, I was like, stopped drawing and I fell in love with design and graphic design. So I went on to do that at university and was so happy and was so passionate and determined to be a graphic designer and then when I started to get my first junior design positions and interning that's when I started to get this feeling of oh no I don't know if this is the path I meant to be on and at the time there was a lot of political changes here in the UK as well as generally all over the world I think it was when Brexit was just starting to be talked about that maybe it will happen and I know that in the US, Trump was also rising. And so I started to draw the way that I felt and about, as well as with my own mental health challenges at the time. And yeah, I posted them online on on social media, on Instagram, and started to get, after a few years of doing that, (laughs) then I started to get work from it. And then at one point, I was kind of doing two jobs at the same time when I realized well, I had a lot of advice from people telling me just to go for it and just to go and try and take the leap. And I did. And I had some amazing support from family, from friends and from people in the creative industry who gave me advice and met up with other illustrators and, yeah, went full time in 2018. And then my book came out. So I was working on my book while still being a graphic designer and then halfway through that process I went full-time as an illustrator and then was focusing a lot on the book and the book came out probably in about no it was probably like eight months then my book came out or maybe less the maths (laughs) so I think that that helped you were working two jobs essentially and so there was already income coming in before you left your graphic design job yeah okay I want to go back to earlier when, in the very beginning, you said when you were in high school, I believe, that you already wanted to do political art, correct? So was that always in you? Like it was always a passion? Yes. My mom's from Chile in in South America. And like a lot of the Latin American countries, they've had to deal with a lot of dictatorships. And my mom grew up in a dictatorship. So she always raised me here in this country to be someone that just was politically aware and and someone to stand up and say things. And and I think, I don't think it was, she thought it was working, but it was definitely working in my own way. And and it was coming out in my art. And I just always did quite like, um, 
I just love talking about important things that people didn't talk about and to try and find new ways to talk about things that might be like boring in terms of politics or heavy. And yeah, I've always kind of had that in me from a young from quite young. And I think that, yeah, it's definitely to do with my mom, a hundred percent. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that you have that passion because it makes your art unique. I think that is just such a cool angle that you bring this extra messaging behind it. And it reminds me the power of art. Art is not just for aesthetics, although yes, it can be beautiful, but art is a way to communicate and send a message. So I'm curious, when did you first start seeing your work start picking up? And why do you think it began resonating with people? Oh, good question. I love that question. Yeah, I think my book Period is a book for children about periods. I believe at the time, the inclusive book, like I I use inclusive language. I drew lots of different kinds of people, different religions, different backgrounds, and talked about mental health in the book as well as so many other things. And I think that definitely helped my career because it was different. But also I think people took me seriously and I think that that helped. I had some mainstream press like quite immediately. I started to be invited to go on panels and things and I think people saw me as an expert, which I don't know if I would call myself. But I I did know a lot about periods to, to make that book. I think that definitely helped. And yeah, like the book came to me. I just had the idea when I went, because at the time there was a lot of protests here in the UK about uh, period poverty and trying to get free period products available in schools for the children that are already on free school meals. So it was really easy to identify these children and who they were. And so I think being around those protests and, and I volunteered for different charities like Bloody Good Period, which I some of the proceeds of the book also went to helping them. So I was meeting so many people, activists and people who were just very inspiring to me. And I think that's when I came up with the idea of the book. But because I was too nervous to ask a publisher to to like pitch it to a publisher I just thought I'm just gonna make it myself I'm just gonna do it myself I'm just gonna try it will be tiny it'll be like a little like self-published scene like a little magazine and that will be it but it did eventually get picked up by a small publisher this is a big roundabout way of saying that I didn't kind of wait around for someone to come and knock on my door to make it even though there were other period books out there I really believed that my one was going to be an excellent add to the pile. And I've kind of feel like the way that I created that book and a few other projects since then have been almost quite in an entrepreneurial spirit. But traditions of the creative industry are you wait until an art director comes to you, you wait till someone asks you to do the project. And then even then you have to make them happy because they're the client. And even though I love my clients, I love working that way. I think so many of us creatives have these ideas and they kind of just stay in our notes folder in our phone. So I think that that early on, I think definitely shaped my career that I talked about it at the pub for a long time. (laughs) Someone needs to make this book and it should be, include lots of different voices and it should talk about mental health. So yeah, I think that that helped. Before we go on, let's take a break to hear about today's sponsor, Fenty Skin. The Fenty Skin Starters are your daily three-step pore-busting regimen to help you get smoother, brighter, and tighter-looking skin. Step one, get clear. Unclog your pores and remove dirt, oil, and makeup without stripping with the Purifying Total Cleanser. Step two, deep treat. Power down on pores, dark spots, and shine with their Fat Water Toner Serum. Step three, Lock and shield. Lock in hydration, reduce the look of pores, target discoloration, and prep skin for makeup with our lightweight Hydra Visor Invisible SPF 30 Moisturizer. The result? Pores that play small, tones that get even, skin that serves bounce, and makeup that looks better. Get the Fenty Skin Starters now at FentySkin.com. 
I think it's amazing that you kind of took it into your own hands. And I think that's what sets you apart, right? Like you said, most artists wait around and they, a lot of artists are, there's like resistance to, to actually finishing a big piece of work like that. So I'm curious, how long was that process of creating that book? And how did you get over those self-doubt thoughts? You know, like a lot of work does not get finished because of all this mental stuff that happens in between. So how did you finish it? And how long did that take? Well, first of all, there are so many projects I haven't finished as well. <laughs> like So many. And so many that I get scared to even like tell people about. <laughs> but I think what helped with that one particular was when it got picked up by a small publisher, I really thought like it was just going to be my friends that bought the book and maybe some people that I knew that had small kids. And then that was it because I was such a new illustrator and I was so naive. You know, I just left my design job. I really was just making it for my friends. And like I became very close to the publishers who published it and we're still really great friends now. So if I drew something and it resonated with them, it made them laugh or, or it made them be like, oh, yes, like it just made them feel something. That's when I that was it. Like, oh, it's going in the book then. And, and it just felt like we were, we were working in a bubble. And a lot of the stuff I make, I try and just, if it resonates with me, if it resonates with someone I know, I try and keep that be the bar. And it doesn't matter. Everything else kind of doesn't matter. And I think what stops me from doing things is when I'm caring too much about what other people think and, oh, my followers might not like this or blah, blah, blah. And I think, as a creative, you have to nurture. I'm so, I feel like I'm telling this to myself as well. I have to try and nurture that, like, okay, trust yourself, trust your voice, and, like, trust your own gut and intuition. And if you're kind of at the pub being like, someone should make this, then then why not you make it? And I think as well what helps me is my background in design. I've been designing <laughs> layouts for magazines. Like, I can do a magazine. And so I think that helped but yeah, I think I'm just as much someone who gets scared as well. And there's definitely been projects that I've been like, no, I can't do it. <laughs> someone else can do it. Yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah, I think a lot of creatives just relate to that feeling. And it's already an achievement just to like get past that and have the work be finished. So I applaud you for that. But like you mentioned, Period was the book that kind of got people's attention. And that's how people started recognizing your work. So, so then what happened after that? Like, are you saying all of your posts on Instagram or just on social media were not, there weren't that many people paying attention? And that it, what was that shift and how did it feel after the book? Yeah, I remember at my book launch, looking at everyone thinking, people are going to read this book, <laughs> being really shocked by it. And I actually think the further my career has gone, the more, I think, pressure I've put on myself. And I definitely see other people feeling the same. And I think when you have no expectation, like anything is like, oh my God, that's amazing. So I think that's been tricky to na navigate. It's definitely helped me, I think, coming into my own, I suppose, business from maybe later, like in my later 20s, because I feel like I know myself. And I always say that I couldn't have started my illustration business before any age, because I think I would have I cared so much about what other people thought or, or just not being that brave or knowing myself. And also when, when I do have those moments of, of wobbles of having people around me that I really trust, that it's just nice to have those people that can talk some sense into you. Because I think as well, the more time has gone on and like after the book came out, then you start to, well, I definitely started to realise like, oh, people are going to see this book and then, you know, bigger clients coming and like I, I remember after the book happened there was this like huge snowball of just being really really busy and one of the most interesting things I always remember another artist telling me is that usually when you're having something really go really well in your career more often than not your personal life is in shambles and I definitely felt that I was going through a breakup like two weeks before the book came out like a long-term relationship and so I was navigating like that with this career just being so chaotically busy navigating like when do I stop if I love my job and I became a bit of a workaholic because I, I loved it so much 
to the point where I used it to run away <laughs> from dealing with my breakup. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny how life, it's, it's like a balancing act. <laughs> So where are you now? Like, so you were very workaholic. And so where in the journey are you now? You know, it was a few months before COVID where I started to really work on that, <laughs> on being like, I'm going to try and go outside and be sociable. And and then COVID happened. And I actually met my now partner during COVID. Like we met online and, and started chatting. So when things opened up again, we went on our first few dates and he's really good at you know when I switch off I'm off work and he at the time ran his own business as well and so I think having and friends as well that have their own business have have been very helpful in we're learning from each other the balance and the when to call it you know enough is enough and and I think as well with the workaholism, I think I have like an addictive personality that I've always been very aware of. <laughs> I'm addicted to sugar, <laughs> always have been. And my my dad's an alcoholic. So I think I've always been very self-aware on like, okay, that is something that that is in my genes. And so I think when I fell in love with my work and I was like, but this is healthy because I love it and it's creative and it brings me joy and I feel like my work is important. That was really difficult to draw those boundaries. And I also had some therapy at the time to, to help me with boundaries. Yeah, it was very, very important and, and definitely surrounding myself with people who now I know if something's in my calendar, just I block out the weekends. I always like a little bit, bit of flexibility because that's the joy of working for yourself. But I always stick to my plans, which I wasn't that good at before. If I make a plan with someone, I stick to it. And, and, and that's definitely a start of navigating, like stop being a workaholic was just making those plans. And, and now I'm just good at making plans with myself. It's like navigating, letting go and just, you know, realizing that I deserve to be taken care of and I can take care of myself and I don't have to work all the time. And I know there's lots of things that were being shared at the, during COVID of like, just because we're not working doesn't mean like we're less valuable. And that was a huge thing for me was like, my value isn't just my work. And what's the point of working so hard if you, if you can't enjoy yourself and you can't take care of yourself, you can't have a bath, if you can't spend time with your friends and family. And, and COVID was great because as I was learning those lessons, they were take, they were taken away from me. <laughs> so I knew as soon as things started to open up again, that I, wasn't going to take it for granted anymore and I wasn't going to cancel on people anymore and uh, I was going to take myself on lots of holidays and I even like working in different places and trying to make my work as enjoyable as possible like I love working outside in the summer and, and yeah it's that's been probably my the thing I've I've felt like I was working on the most the last few years. Yeah, I can definitely relate. I think as a creator, sometimes you get so tied up with your work, like it almost equals your identity and who you are. And it's a whole process learning to recognize that it doesn't, it is not your identity. It is just like your art can be separate from who you are. Your work can be separate from who you are. And, and yeah, so I relate to what you're saying. I do want to go back to just the type of art that you choose to create. For example, you talk about topics like social issues, sex, mental health, and you also believe in like inclusivity and representation. So can you talk about why you're passionate about these topics? Why is it so important to you? I love this question. I think it's just important to me because that's just my life. That's just my world. I like to draw my friends. I like to draw the people that I see on the street. And also I'm Latina, so I never really saw, I mean, I think Jennifer Lopez was probably the only Latina that I saw, Shakira. And so it was always really, I think for a long time, having a different culture in my home and then going into school, I always felt ashamed of it or sexualized for it. And when I, I've done different forms of therapy throughout my life, but coming to the full acceptance of, and being proud, being a proud Latina, that has been really important to me. And you can only do that if you see it. And so 
very early on in my career, even though I'm very shy, <laughs> much better now, but I'm quite quiet. I like to talk with my illustrations. I don't like to speak. I like to use my art to, to say what I'm thinking. And I made a decision very early on that I was going to talk on my Instagram stories, that I was going to show my face, that I was going to say yes to any public speaking or any panels that came my way, any podcasts, because I did my dissertation on other Latin creatives, specifically from Chile, and I could not find any. And there is a few, but you know, just with a Google, it was hard to find, I think I found like four or five. And so even though they're probably out there, they just might not have it in their Instagram bio, they might not have it on their website, you know, I'm a Chilean artist. And so or a Latin artist. And so that was also very important to me very early on. And I think it just was natural that I drew people that I knew that I experienced myself. And yeah, I think that it's it wasn't really like, oh, I'm going to try and be as inclusive as possible. It was just like, I just draw, draw what I experience and what I see. So yeah. I think that's really nice because it's not like you're forcing it. You're literally, it's coming out in a natural way because it's so honest. You're just like, I want to see people that look like me and like my friends. I think that's what makes your work like resonate and feel pure because I think inclusivity can feel forced now. Like a lot of brands try to do that. And it's kind of confusing, like where the line is like, yes, we want to be inclusive, but like, if you can tell it's being, it's kind of fake. Like, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> like more and more people trying to be inclusive. So many thoughts. <laughs> Because I, I actually, I'm not sure what was right. It wasn't the norm for so long, I think. And I know even if I just look at the stats of people in the creative industry, like if I, if I, if you look around, like people looking around the right in the office, I think the creative industry has really low numbers of people from different ethnic groups. And even just in like getting working class people and, and people from low income backgrounds as well. Like I think the stat in the UK is like there's less than 15% of us because I'm also from a working class family, like have been able to get their foot in the door of the creative industry. So I think that that ha plays a cute, huge part, has to. And, and I think that's where it comes from. And then I think with social media, even though it has lots of, dangerous and scary things about it I think that what has come from it has been people being able to use their voice and and people who might not necessarily have been given a voice from someone else have made their own voices heard and I think that has put pressure on people to not only open their eyes but even to just put pressure on people who don't want to open their eyes and I think that's what I think it is and I think some people, I mean, the majority of people, I think, are really like they learn something new and they're happy and they want to be part of the change. And that's been my experience and that's what I see. But I'm sure there's lots of people that are not, <laughs> not wanting to work that way. Well, it's more like I think it's because I, I follow people who talk about marketing and branding. And some people are like, oh, because of capitalism, brands hire all the different types of models, you always have like every type of body shape and person. And although, yes, it's inclusive, but at the same time, it's like, you can tell it's fake, <laughs> right? Or, but I guess it is good because representation does matter. So even though, you know, they're doing it because they want to make money, appease audiences, it is giving us representation. So that's why it's kind of, it's, it's not like a black and white where it's like all good, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I know we, we just had pride month as well. And I, I hear some things that people don't want to work on those projects, but, oh, it would be good paid, so I'll do it. I'm not going to tell my family that I worked on this project for Pride. And, and I, that, I hear things like that on the grapevine. <laughs> so it breaks my heart. So, yeah, I 100% hear you that some people are, are really pushed back to things. And, yeah, there's still a lot of, a lot of work to be done, I think, in... in making that the norm and making that something to be celebrated. Right. I think to me, it matters if it, like it needs to come from an authentic place and feel honest and real. Like don't try to be something you're not just because it's a trend to be super inclusive. 
Okay. So in terms of your creative projects, how do you decide what projects to work on next? Like, what are you thinking and what do you consider when making that decision? Ooh, I always love trying something new, actually. And I love when people are like, I know this is a bit different, but what do you think of this? I I love it when something, you know, so many projects I've done now have been so different. And I love that people see like, oh, I saw this thing and I think it will work really well here. And yeah, I think I just, it's nice because everything I say yes to always just makes me really excited and really happy. And I think that gut intuition is is really important to me. And I think when I was younger, that was really difficult. Well, early on in the, in the biz, <laughs> in the, it, being an artist, it was really difficult because, you know, so many people don't want to pay you fairly. So many people, you know, try and take advantage of young artists and not pay them at all. I remember you know, having so many requests to do unpaid work and thinking, oh gosh, should I do it? Because it should, it will help my career. And, and it's just a hundred percent never worth it (laughs) to do unpaid work. And so it's really nice now when I have work coming in that I think I just know myself. I feel like that's a common theme that I keep saying of just, I know when something's right. I know when someone wants me for me. And I know that you know, what doesn't feel right. But I'm lucky that I have the most amazing clients and everyone that I've worked, I've had such an amazing time. And yeah, I always love hearing new projects, like something that I've never done before always really excites me and pushes me at my comfort zone. And yeah. Nice. You keep talking about how you are an artist, but it's also a business. I'm curious, how do you manage your time? between those two things? Like, do you spend like half the time designing and then half the time literally working on the business side? Or what does that look like? I mean, for me, I feel like every day a week is different. I do try and keep a structure. And I think what really helped me as an artist was just looking at myself like I'm a creative business. I think that really helped like building structure, building routines, being like, that's it now. I need to stop working. Whereas like, oh, I'm an artist. I'm just going to like go with the flow and and just maybe I'll draw today. (laughs) So I think really helped me is looking at myself as a creative business. And I try and hit a few things in the week and keep some sort of structure. But I'd be lying if I said that (laughs) don't do that all the time. I try and do always set time every week to write on big projects, on big things that like pitch ideas and like think, okay, what's what's in my notes that's something I've not been paying attention to. But sometimes I have seasons. I have seasons of you probably have this as well, where things are, you know, usually for me, I have about Valentine's Day, like that lead up to Valentine's Day quite busy as well as I just had a busy period like early summer end of spring and then Christmas since 2018 those have been three times in the year that I have a lot of deadlines and so I organize my shop preparation in July this month this is when I'm doing it and then I go on holiday in August and yeah in the week I try and make time to write I I used to have I kind of always flip and flop between doing admin tasks in the afternoon or the morning and then drawing and creative tasks on the other. But I I like to flip and flop between them both. But I always, before bed, I always write my three most important top priority things to do the next day. So when I wake up, I don't have to think. I can just write, get on with it. And then usually around three o'clock is when like have a time when like my brain starts to have that afternoon slump and then that's when I'm usually working on things that you know some idea in my notes that I haven't paid much attention to and I I'll try and pay attention to that but I I do have some things of the week like I do a bit of Patreon as well as newsletters and so there are definite things in the week that I try and stick to and then in the year I have I feel like I feel like this is so (laughs) businessy I feel like there are yeah there are periods where I'm like okay I know this is when I'm really busy so I'm going to try and write a like a new essay for something that could potentially be a book pitch like during that time and so when I'm working on I, I don't know it's difficult because thing, then things pop up and you kind of well for me I'm just sometimes I have a big project that I just I just finished one and all my time was on that I try and keep things to like 
in the month, what is the creative project that no one's asking me to do that I'd really love to do? And even if it's just like a social media post to just start. Lately, I've been doing a lot of pitching for ideas, like like I said about my book. Like for future books, you mean? Future books, future potential ideas that I have that would be really fun because I think I spent the last few years just like saying yes to everything and then all my ideas went on the back burner this year I've been focusing a lot on on pitching and I've gotten a lot of rejection but I'm still going (laughs) okay the next question I wanted to ask is I know some of your art is working with clients and then the other side is like actually creating the stuff that you want to create just to post online so are you always working on both types of projects at a time and what is your process of like creating something of your own, just your own idea? Yeah, I like to use social media in that way of just like working on ideas and things that for me, social media feels like a sketchbook, like quite like, does this resonate with people and interested to hear what other people think on a certain topic as well. So I've definitely used social media in that sense. And I also have my own personal sketchbooks and every morning I do journaling and I might do affirmations on one page and doodle on the other. So I always feel like those are my best ideas. And also when I run, I have like ideas come to me. But I think that been a shift this year for me where I do keep things a bit quiet, (laughs) especially when pitching ideas. I kind of work for maybe doing a pitch and then stuff and um, not bringing it into social media but I feel like maybe I need to be a bit more brave and maybe I should merge the two but yeah social media I definitely find hard like I feel like some months I'm like feeling so inspired and other months I feel like I need to have a bit of a step back and I find them because I mean I started when I started it was just Instagram And with just posts and now with like reels and TikTok and so many things, I definitely feel like a little grandma. I feel really like overwhelmed by all the options. It is overwhelming. (laughs) It is. And so I feel like some, I feel maybe like a lot of creators where I'm like, what should I be doing? Should I not be doing posts? Should I be doing videos? But I, I feel like I've been using the, I always wanted to learn animation. And so when the videos thing popped up, I was like, okay, I know I'm feeling overwhelmed, but is there something in this that I want to progress in myself? Like, is there something I've been wanting to do in video format? And it was always animations. I was looking back to go back to study animation, maybe a master's or something. So I I have really been enjoying doing those little animations and doing like three top tips and things, which has been different it is hard and and since you're mainly an illustrator working with clients like do you also give like have your own schedule for posting on social media or are you more fluid like whenever I'm inspired I will post I had so many schedules and I just don't stick to them I try and batch create I think that that's what I try and do and I used to make sure that you know I have a post that's promoting my shop once a week but I just I haven't been doing that and I think I have moments when I'm like very structured and then moments when I'm like I'm just gonna batch create everything and then see what comes out <laughs> and then go through my sketchbooks is there a lost idea that I want to explore a bit more I think sometimes when I overthink things and think maybe a bit more like a business would do, then I do get in my head a lot more. Whereas I feel like pre-COVID, when I never really had a social media plan, stuff still looked cohesive because it was me. It was my voice. I always talk about things I want to talk about. It was still, there were still running themes that through the work. So I think I've been pulling back from the little marketing plan that I made myself (laughs) and just batch creating things rather than like I think sometimes I I can just overthink things a bit and then I don't make anything what are your thoughts do you do you have a little like how do you feel about all of those things well because I do lean more towards content creators so I do have like in my head I have a schedule I want to stick to but again I don't always stick to it and I 
like maybe earlier on in my career, I was a stickler, like more like, oh, I, I have to post every Wednesday on my YouTube channel, blah, blah, blah. But then over the years, I had to be more flexible with myself and be like, it's okay to take a break. Don't burn yourself out. Like it's not the end of the world if you can't deliver on time. So now I'm much more fluid and allowing myself to to not be so structured because I feel like I can relate to your way of thinking. <laughs> There's always these things like, oh, oh, I should be doing that, but I'm not really doing that right now. Or I'm not the most structured person behind the scenes either. But I, I think it's nice for creatives to hear this because it's just a reminder, like you don't have to be perfect. And also there are ebbs and flows in your inspiration and, and that's okay. Like if you feel inspired or motivated, great. Like let everything like, create, let it come out. But if you don't feel like creating, don't try to force it too hard because what you create isn't going to be that good anyway. <laughs> if you don't have that spark. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, when I've had my social media breaks this year, I've still been getting just as much client work. And so it's been a lesson for me. And I've been telling my friends like, oh, look, like we can have breaks and, you know, the world doesn't just stop. So it's nice to hear that you're also <laughs> going with the, with the flow. Yeah. So what are your tips for aspiring illustrators or digital artists? What do you think are, I guess, the most important things that they should keep in mind? It's probably just to pay attention to your own voice. You know, I think so many people... I mean, I know what it's like starting out. It's like, okay, what do art directors want? What should I put in my portfolio? Like, what do people want? What's going to make me get hired? And the best advice I can give is just to be really true to yourself. And especially if there's something that people aren't talking about, or there's something about you that you don't feel like you fit in in any way, like bring that into your work. And I think that's what's going to help you not only stand out from other in your industry, but I think we forget, so many of us forget that even people that hire other artists or hire the creatives, they're people too. And the amount of messages I get of, of clients who were like, you know, this post really resonated with me and I shared this with my daughter and then we had this conversation about periods. And, and that is something that I really love about other artists is that they're not only making work for companies but they're making work for people and they're making like work to be consumed by the public and that's the most beautiful thing about art that can resonate with you know you don't have to be what I like about my illustrations is that it you don't have to be you know a certain type of person to connect with it and I, anytime anything is a bit too complicated as well I like to maybe simplify it even more as someone that has uh, dyslexia. So I think just put yourself in your work. If there's something that someone has told you that, oh, I don't know about that, just do it anyway. Because I think, you know, that artist, that uh, teacher that told me that I would never get anywhere if I wanted to do political work, I think he really meant well. I think he's, he really was concerned that he was like, I want you to be able to pay your rent <laughs> when you're older. I want you to be safe. So I think a lot of these this feedback can come from a place of like, in my experience, like this is what you should be doing. And the reality is like a lot of people starting out, a lot of artists, whether you're quite young or wanting to change your career, like there's something valuable in your own voice. And that's definitely something that I've learned along the way. So that's what I would say is just be really true to yourself. And, you know, it's okay to also have a full-time job whilst you're creating and putting things online. It's, it's okay to, for things to take a really long time because I think just keep showing up because things took a long time for me and there's so many amazing successful artists that you know became successful in their 40s and their 50s so yeah I think just keep showing up and if you're doing the work that resonates with yourself and makes yourself proud that's enough and that's the bar like I aim for because then it doesn't matter like what else happens because you've made yourself proud and 
I think, yeah, that's that's probably the best advice I can get. <laughs> I don't know, on the top of my head. No, that was beautiful. <laughs> that was so that was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's because it reminds artists like what truly matters. Like you remember you have a voice, you are unique, and create work that resonates with yourself. Cause if it resonates with your soul as a human being, it's gonna resonate with another human being out there. That's what powerful art does. Yeah. So thank you for that. I also want to ask you, what is the most difficult part of your career? Difficult part. It'll be all about money, I think. Money was so hard. And and I touched on it earlier, like, oh, should I take unpaid work? Because I've had so many brands in the early days ask me to do unpaid work. And I was like, oh, no, I can't say no to this huge international company. Like, Is there a huge brand they should not be asking for unpaid work? That's the worst. (laughs) Yes, 100%. And my DMs are open. I'll tell you all the names. <laughs> but it happens so much to, to young people. And I think coming from a working class background, a background where my, my family just weren't talking about money, I didn't get like this, this like sit down and like, oh, it's time to open a savings account. <laughs> Talk on like savings and how to charge what you're worth and and how to negotiate. And I think that that unfortunately hinders a lot of different types of people especially people that came from a similar background to me because money it's like navigating all of that navigating and negotiating like clients being like how much we charge for an illustration like figuring all of that out at the start oh my it was so an emotional yeah what are your tips how did you figure it out for illustrators I don't know if it's just in the UK we have the association of illustrators that you can become a member of they're very helpful. Speaking to other people, I always say my DMs are always open. If any other illustrators want advice or they don't know what to charge, like always, my DMs are always open. And I say that because I used to ask other illustrators as well. And I had so much amazing feedback from other artists also saying that. So in the artist community, there's everyone is very, in my experience, very warm and want to share their information and knowledge because I think the difficult thing about undercharging yourself is that it brings the whole industry down because that client will think oh that's how much I need to pay these illustrators and if it's under valuing yourself it could create that situation again for someone else. I think just having open conversations and there are a lot of artists that are always talking about money and so as I've had my career I've always tried to do the same and I've learned that from from all the other illustrators and I think diving into those you know negotiating for dummies books and like reading up and doing your research I think there's this really big book that I have on money for I think it's illustrator's guide to pricing and just not putting your head in the sand like just Imagine it's like a course you're taking at university and just try and get as much knowledge as as possible. And then different types of jobs as well will need a different way of pricing, like doing murals that I've done before is is a different way of pricing per project. I also, I wouldn't have like a flat day rate. I don't share my flat day rate, like in comparison to when I was a designer, I would have a day rate when I freelance because... I charge per project. So it depends on how big the client is. If it's a small business, I might negotiate on the price because less people will see it. It'll be less valuable to them. And also on my website, I have a little hire me section that I always share with young illustrators or illustrators that are wanting to know about pricing because that has like a huge list of all the questions I ask my clients, like, where's this going and all that stuff. And, and, is it going to be printed to a, a private event or will it be printed for a worldwide audience? And how also we work in licensing, which is like you can have it for a year, six months, five years, like all of that <laughs> the difference makes a difference to the price. So, yeah, it's it's overwhelming at the start, but there's a lot of people that are very happy to be open about how they charge as well. And that's why I love so much about other creatives is that, 
you know, there's so many amazing creatives being open about and having those conversations, you know, me and my friends, we have like a little WhatsApp and we're always being like, what should I charge with this project that I've never, ever done before? <laughs> so yeah, I think definitely jump, like finding a community, which can be hard, but going to events and speaking to people and DMing people, that's, you know, how I figured it out as well. Nice. Yeah, there, there's so much of work and figuring these details out behind the scenes that most people don't realize. Another question I have for you is what do you do when you have a creative block? Ooh, I take a break and I also have a lot of sketchbooks because I, yeah, I journal most mornings. So usually what I would do if I want to be creative, but I feel like I don't know what to be, if I feel well rested, if I had been outside that day and I've had a good meal and I still want to be creative but I'm just feeling not feeling right I will flick through my old sketchbooks and think like oh could I redraw something that I've drawn before or is there a sketch or is there like a line could I just illustrate it and just pick up an with an old idea especially like my illustrations through difficult periods where maybe I wasn't ready to share it on social media and also, usually when I'm on my period, I don't want to make anything. <laughs> so I, that's one thing I've got in my calendar that, you know, I always note when, when I'm due on my period because I have really high energy and I feel really creative during that time. And then usually when I'm on my period, I've like scheduled things out or like made sure that I hit a deadline like a little bit earlier if, if I have a yeah. client work. Oh, that's so smart. <laughs> it's smart that you track your energy level during your, with your cycle because it's, it's so true. Like I think people forget about it. <laughs> yeah, I just want to rest. And there might be a couple of like client tweaks or like editing of something. But yeah, I always try and, and schedule those breaks because they're so important and that's what makes you know you, it's difficult because it's like a creative block can come because you could be just exhausted or burnt out or it could be like I feel creative but I don't know what to draw or something so I think it's really important to know those things and have a checklist like have I been outside today <laughs> right like have I taken care of myself in general Okay. So Natalie, what is next for you? Like what are any current or future goals that you want to share? Ooh, I'm going to learn how to drive. I know that's like not to do with my work, but I'm going to, to learn how to drive. I've just been looking at a car that I've agreed to buy and I'm 30. So I feel like this is a really big deal. For me. So that's really exciting. So I also care for my dad that has Alzheimer's and he has, we've just got carers for him. So we're, me and my mum are in this moment where we're, things are starting to be really exciting that we're able to have our lives back a little bit. And so I feel really excited for the future and I feel really happy right now. And I feel like there's a lot of bravery that's coming out for me in terms of, you know, like I mentioned earlier, like going out and trying to get what I make projects happen that I want to make and I'm always working on a book idea I'm always writing and I think really the thing I want probably to focus on the most moving forward is just making the work that I want to make I've mentioned before that I can like overthink things and like should I make more of this kind of work because it had so many likes on social media and I think one thing I really want to focus on is just going through my sketchbooks and thinking like, is there something I could redo and share that like makes me really excited and makes, brings me joy or is something that, I don't know, I feel like I want to, I want to come back to that gut intuition of just drowning out the noise, drowning out all the social media and just draw more. I feel like I, I feel like I don't draw enough. <laughs> I love hearing that. Yeah, it, it sounds like you're very, you're in tune with who you are as an artist because it is so easy to get pulled in all these directions. Oh, this is what people want to see. This is what I'm getting hired for. And some people tend to just create more of those things, but they're not listening to what's inside. So I love hearing that from you. I mean, I had just had a bit of a wobble this, this year where I was like, I don't know where I'm going. So I feel like I've had some real serious conversations with myself and some meltdowns. So I feel like I'm coming out the other end where I feel a bit more like in tune with like what I right. want from the future. So yeah, those moments are important though, to have those conversations for yourself to, to get those kind of deep answers. 
based on the ideas that you have that you want to create, are there like big topics? Like what, what are the topics that you want to talk about? Oh, I have, ex- I, all I can say is I've got something really exciting coming in like autumn that's to do with periods. So there's going to be a lot more period stuff coming from me that I've kind of had to hold on to that I've not been able to share. And yeah, I'd love to do more stuff for children. I think that has been something that I've really want to focus on in the future and maybe more writing. And then that's all I can say. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's exciting. Thanks for sharing what you can. What is one piece of advice you would give to your younger self? It's just be kinder to herself. Like she was so hard on herself and I wouldn't, even though I've made mistakes along the way, like we all have, I feel like everything has taught me to be the person I am today. And so I don't, you know, I feel really at peace with my life. And so I feel like when I was younger, I was so tough on myself, I put so much pressure on myself and I blame myself for everything. And yeah, I was just struggling with my mental health and then so much. And and I was so, I was a child. And so that's one thing I would say to my younger self is just, just don't be so hard on yourself. You know, we're humans, we're allowed to, like, I have this drawing that's like how we assume our life will go, which is like A to B and how it like it really is. And it's like all, all squiggly, wiggly and diagonal and, and life is like that. And I think that's what makes life beautiful. And I think I'm very proud of the person that I am today, but I wouldn't have learned like the lessons I've learned without learning them. I think Oprah says something like, you know, once you know, or something like that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, definitely be kinder to herself. And yeah, everything works out. Everything works out anyway. So just, it's difficult to say to enjoy yourself because I know that I was not. <laughs> Maybe uh, stick to to some mental health therapy. I definitely had a lot of that when I was younger, which I'm happy for. But yeah, maybe I would just say like, I'm so proud of her as well for everything. So yeah, and for getting help when I needed it as well. So I didn't think I would have I thought that way. And yeah, those are the two things. Be kind to herself. And like, I probably would say that I'm proud of her. I love that. So sweet. All right, Natalie, where can we find you online? Oh, I am Natalie Byrne, that's B-Y-R-N-E, on Instagram. And on TikTok, I'm the same, but with an underscore underneath after it. And yeah, my website is natalieburn.uk. So that's B-Y-R-N-E. And that's, yeah, you can find everything about me on there. I try and keep it the same. <laughs> Basically her name. We'll have all the links in the show notes. Make sure you check out Natalie Burns' work. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. And I wish you all the best with your creative journey. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I've had the best time talking to you. 